Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here for another professional conversation with friends. I'd like to introduce you to two amazing people. The first is Dr. Christopher Watson, an educational psychologist and the founding director of the Reflective Practice Center at the University of Minnesota. I also want to share with you that he won the Deborah Weatherston Infant Mental Health Leadership Award in 2020, which is not surprising. And we're here to talk about the Rios Guide to Supervision and Consultation for Infant and Early Childhood Field. And Christopher has been the lead author on this project. You can read more about his wonderful work on this slide. And then my dear friend, Deborah Ottman, who is the Professional Development Coordinator at the Center for Early Education and Development, also known as SEEDS, at the University of Minnesota. I also want to share that she is the lead director, coordinator, manager of an online training program for professionals. And I invite you to go visit that. We'll make sure the link for those programs is in the narrative of this video. Deb was also very, very involved in the creation of the Rios and supporting a self-study guide that goes with that. So I want to also let you know that this is the link where you can purchase the Rios. We'll also make sure that's in the narrative to this video. And here's a picture when I got to go to Minnesota and see my dear friends at their wonderful conference. Shout out to Minnesota Association for Mental Health. Loved having an opportunity to visit with you. And I now want you to meet my wonderful friends. Hello. Thank you both for being here with me today. Hello there. Hi. Thanks for having us, Barbara. My pleasure. So you jumped into this huge project about creating the Rio Sky. You have to let's first start with what Rio stands for, Christopher. Oh, call it the okay. Rio Sky. Probably a good idea. Yeah. The reflective interaction observation scale. Okay. And the reason we called it that was because initially the project entailed creating a research tool to look at reflective supervision and consultation. And so we use the the terminology of observation scale, because that's how we started mm -hmm. uh, the project by observing many, many reflective sessions that were uh, video recorded and started to look at what was happening in those reflective sessions between a reflective supervisor and a supervisee. I love that, Christopher, because it, I mean, I think I'm just oh, it's so excited. So that's where we started, right? We always talk about observing the dyad and exactly. noticing the interaction, the back and forth cueing between the parent and the baby. And here we've taken that model to supervision because it's it's always a parallel process where you started with observing the dyad. Right. <laughs> and noticing the cues I'm imagining that were helpful versus less helpful. And I'm jumping in and here we yeah. have a guide about yeah. I'm assuming what you noticed. Yes, indeed. It all started out with a group of 50 people at a conference in Scottsdale, Arizona, sponsored by the Alliance for the Advancement of Infant Mental Health. And everyone in the room was very curious about what makes reflective supervision so powerful. And what does it, what is it unique, what is unique about it? What makes it so uh, compelling to those who have experienced it? And to help demystify it for those people who really didn't understand at that time, and some still don't, mm -hmm. what it is that happens in a reflective supervision session. So that piece about observing by all 50 of us led to a, quite a long list of characteristics, behaviors, uh, things that were said, ways of physically being with each other, that we, over the years, literally over eight years, we refined and uh, consolidated to a short list that became the Rios tool. Yay! You mentioned demystifying reflective supervision, which I love that. And it's, it's um, when I train, I always say to people, what makes it difficult is it's not a procedure. It's not like a set of steps we can teach you. It's an evolving process that is co-created. So right. the teaching of it, um, again, it's in the doing and it's in, and it's sort of, it's so difficult to, to move people into this space of doing, particularly if you have not been in that space of receiving, specifically if you haven't received reflective supervision. So this real intentional focus on 
the relational qualities is kind of what I'm hearing in your story, if that's a, a fair way to restate that. What what are the relational qualities? What does this kind of look like, feel like? What does it smell like? I mean, the sensory right. playing a piece of it because there is yeah. there is a feel of a re reflective process mm -hmm. that you kind of for me it's like you know when you're in it, and yes. you really know when you're not too. Yeah, yes. and mm -hmm. from a professional development standpoint, we we talk about it from the and well, this goes to all infant and early childhood mental health practice. You can't give what you don't get. And so for us to be able to um, quantify to a greater degree um, what's happening, professionals then can learn what it is they need to be giving, mm -hmm. but you have to experience it first. Definitely. And in infant and early childhood mental health, we do a lot of reflective supervision. And a lot of these tools, I want everyone paying attention to listen, <laughs> are kind of have infant and early childhood. But I want you to understand that the tools in reflective practice and in the Rios, we can use them with any eight. We can use them with teens. We can right. use them in couples therapy. We mm -hmm. can use them with adults, we can also use them in management development. So don't be thrown by the fact that a lot of this work started in the infant and early childhood mental health community it is not in any way limited to those relationships. And I'm seeing that my friends definitely agree. Yeah, that's that's so important to emphasize. We we have one project at, at SEED at the University of Minnesota that involved working with adolescents and once again, just as you said, the principles remain the same. They're just applied to a different age and developmental level. Mm -hmm. And yet they, they are still powerful and, and consistent. And it is all about relationships and how relationships are the, the bedrock of what we do, including services to children and families. Mm -hmm. It's the starting point. Yeah. And I see in the in the book, in the Rios Guide, there's a shout out to some of our, our luminaries in the field, Rebecca Shimon Chinook, Jerry Paul, Donald Winnicott, you know, and it's just, it's lovely to have these icons still present in the work. Yes. And we, we get to stand on their shoulders in a lot of ways. And so we get to take those nuggets and build on them, which is always, it always brings me joy that we, you know, we're, we're remembering our, our leaders reflecting on our past as we prepare for our future. I think that's just a, a lovely piece of infant mental health storytelling in, in the body of the work. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want to ask a little bit about, because there's, um, I, I'm not, I don't want to get into too much of the detail of the circle and trying to explain that to everyone, but some of the elements that we remind supervisors about are specifically holding the baby or the child in mind. And as we sort of, as we're sitting here and talking and sharing, I'm thinking about, holding the baby, holding the child, holding the teenager, you know, holding the supervisee, holding um, compassion um, for our fellow human in the world. And I, I just kind of want to think together about this idea of holding the other with compassion and kind of what, what, your, what just what your heart speaks to you around what that feels like, what that looks like, and how, even how we as individuals, whether you're you know, you can be a barista and you can hold someone else in mind with compassion. So mm -hmm. just thinking about that, that skill and what that looks like and how we support it. Oh, wow. Yeah. I know you didn't expect that. <laughs> no, no, I, I haven't been asked that question. And I haven't, I guess I haven't asked myself that question at any point specifically. Um, well, again, I think that the larger piece and I read an article recently about this, uh, describing uh, an attempt to describe wokeness, mm -hmm. a very contemporary mm -hmm. hot button issue. And what struck me about this particular piece of writing was the author broke it down to saying that it's, wokeness is simply about empathy. And I thought that was an interesting mm -hmm. connection there. Yeah. That the, the first step is to be, to be able to, well, we, at once we 
know ourselves and are self-aware, at the same time, we are aware of others and where they're coming from and have a curiosity that, that is fueled by empathy because we, because we care about each other, because humans are made to take care of each other, not to live in isolation. Babies immediately need the care of adults longer than any other species. Mm -hmm. So it's all about learning, constantly learning throughout life, how we can support each other, which of course then feeds us as well. Well said, I love that. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting when you said the word holding, how are we holding people that, that um, the image of how we hold, um, are we holding someone roughly or are we holding them tenderly and with compassion? Um, and we, we use that word a lot, um, but I think when we, uh, give it attributes or we, you know, modify how we talk about holding, that's where that, you know, to Christopher's point, that we're holding them tenderly and with compassion and um, with that other perspective. Um, and and I, I think that's one of the things that the Rios does is that it, with when we think about it, even starting with that reflective alliance, um, it assumes certain qualities, mm -hmm. and and compassion is key. It's it's mm -hmm. fundamental. And talking about the notion of trust, mm -hmm. which is also what's generated in a compassionate relationship. And as far as reflective supervision goes, we have this, um, uh, what, what might seem like contradictory goal, which is to create a safe space for professionals to talk about themselves and their work mm -hmm. and talk about the, the families and the, the children that they serve or the staff that they manage if they're an administrator or the policies that they're developing yes, they're yes. a policy maker. Um, but at the same time as creating a safe space where there is trust built between two or more individuals, we also talk now increasingly about a brave space. Mm -hmm. And by that, we mean mm -hmm. that within that relationship, we can address things that are really difficult and give voice to things that uh, are, are highly um, rea uh, produce reactivity mm -hmm. in, in us and mm -hmm. others. And, but we're able to do that because the relationship is built on trust. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that if a supervisor is asking a supervisee to be open, and vulnerable, the first thing that has to happen, of course, is that person has to feel the trusting relationship mm -hmm. and the compassion of the supervisor or the uh, reflective consultant. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult day, and so many of us are doing clinical and administrative supervision. A lot of us have a blended model. And I parallel that to parents and not to infantilize supervisees. However, supervision is a nurturing activity. I say that all the time. We are nurturing supervisees to be their best selves, just like parents are nurturing children to be their best selves, right? And so there is that we want to create safety. We want to create brave spaces. We want to, we want a whole contradiction. You can disagree with me in supervision. Mm -hmm. We, I, as a supervisor, can hold that level of challenge. And how do we create the safety for staff to challenge us in areas where we may not have information about different isms, about ableism, about you know racism, about homophobia, about xenophobia, and all of these pieces that are impacting our society, that are impacting relationships, and that are impacting development because of access 
and privilege. And we know this, we know this. <clears throat> and so we're sort of shout out, start talking about it in supervision. We, yeah. we yeah. as supervisors, right? We need to also be prepared to receive that from a lens, not of threat, but from a lens of curiosity. Yes. And you know what, what, what you just brought up, Barbara, the other thing that it makes me think about and, and what Christopher just talked about is this, what may seem contradictory of a safe space and a brave space and bringing all, all the weighted uh, tendrils that you've talked about with bringing those isms into the space. I think about, um, we've all heard that um, the reflective supervisory relationship is a relationship for learning. And we learn through making mistakes. We learn from having a mentor or a facilitator or someone who holds us um, with respect as well so that we can come into this space having made mistakes professionally or personally but then also having an opportunity to explore where we've not hit the mark and how might we think about how how might we do better after as we continue to learn and grow in this relationship and i think that um, also is one of the um, one of the beauties of participating in this particular type of activity is um, we have the safety to fail or at least to admit where we failed or not hit the mark and we can talk about it with bravery and with hope and compassion so hopefully if if you know we're coming into it with a um, with good intent that'll happen I love that when you said the bravery to, to fail. I mean, you said so many like brilliant things, but when you said that, that bravery to fail, I thought, how many times do infants fail before they master a skill? Yeah. Right. And we're, and we're so, we're often not gracious with ourselves, right. you know? Yeah. And it's like yeah. every failure is a, a, a step towards success. I mean, you know, you're getting closer to approximation <laughs> of the goal, right? You're getting closer to where you're headed. And there's yeah. so much, I mean, even the word when you said failure, I could feel my own nervous system getting a little activated by that. You know, we, we've put such a judgment on 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 not achieving success, but you got you got to make a lot of mistakes before you get where you want to go. Yeah, yeah. The other we thing we won't that, talk about how many revisions of the Rios there were. Shh, we won't. Say no, that. no, we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what that brought my, to my mind was how many times supervisors state. In, in a reflective session, state that they themselves have learned so much from their supervisees. That happens over and over again. So that reciprocity of the learning, it is so fundamental. And it's part of what we talked about earlier. Uh, Deb and I were talking about the, the uh, quality of humility one must have, I think, in order to have that successful reflective relationship. So that's, of course, true for both the supervisor and the supervisee. A willingness to look at ourselves and consider that we may not have kind of, as you said, hit the mark yeah. uh, and acknowledge that and think about what that means for us going forward. Getting back to the compassion piece, now, maybe every generation feels this way, but in every point in time has someone who articulates this. But I think more that today from me, when I hear colleagues talking about their work, the issue of compassion really is so, so vital and so important because I think we're so, in, a, in a place culturally in terms of society, historically, in terms of, of our um, of our organizations, of our ways of being with each other in groups and as a country, as states, whatever, in the United States, I think um, 
we need this space in order to breathe, have support, have the ability to be vulnerable and learn from our, mm -hmm. from our shortcomings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, related to that, so, um, so you referred to the, the diagram of the Rio. So one of the components that the Rios looks at is professional use of self is how do we as a professional bring ourself to the work we're doing, whether it's in direct service, whether it's as a supervisor or an administrator. And what you just said about all the pressures outside of this kind of sacred space mm -hmm. um, or the safe space um, is this need always to be right. That is one of the things that that is so present right now is, and it's yeah. divisive. It's, you know, always us versus them. Mm -hmm. But I also think related to that is this need for us to bring that professional role um, to our work. And that comes with it that there's a sense of being right as a professional. Um, and we're not always right. And um, so speaking to someone who's authored um, DEI content for us, both in the Rios <laughs> and in other professional development tools, one of the things that your work has so powerfully demonstrated is this notion of implicit bias. Um, and even how, you know, what does that implicit bias look like for us in terms of how we look at what we should be mm -hmm. um, as professionals um, yeah. and how, how does that impact our work? And so the other thing that I think this space of um, being in this reflective partnership, how does it permit us to just lay that burden down and to, of uh, being right or being the expert. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, we can better see where our biases may have come in and um, impacted or colored our thinking mm -hmm. and the way we treat others mm -hmm. and work with our families and work with our most vulnerable little people who who are dependent on may, everyone else making decisions. Yeah. For them. yeah. <laughs> Yes. Thank you for acknowledging that, Deb. Yeah, I came in. I first learned about the Rios when I was asked to review <laughs> some of the content from a diversity equity lens. And um, all goodness. of the team was yeah. quite gracious in accepting my feedback and being in awe of it to some degree and running with it. And so I'm, I'm grateful to have had some influence on the document as well. So thank you for oh, that. And we are grateful to you. So my goodness. Grateful. Yeah, it, it, it was the missing um, ingredient. Because um, as I've learned from you, and I agree with you, this notion that culture really is the framing and the uh, what holds and colors how each of us um, come into the world, come into the work and our relationships. Um, I, I don't think either of us can overstate the importance of um, this overlay of DEI. I wouldn't even call it an overlay. I would call it a strand that's Good. been woven mm -hmm. into every single piece of mm -hmm. the Rios. Yeah. It, Thank it's, you. So proud of you. So proud of you both for noticing that was missing and then saying we, we have to have it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted to just build on something you also mentioned about that expert role. I think also, you know, we've been conditioned, at least I was conditioned in graduate mm -hmm. school, that whole um, expert role, you know, this whole idea that you, I have the knowledge, I've, 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 I've consumed all the latest research. And so, and therefore I am informed and I'm not, you know, anyone who has an advanced degree in, in whatever field, I'm proud of the work you do. I know how hard it was to get that degree, been there and, and all of our science is also evolving and changing, just as we are evolving and changing mm -hmm. and relationships are not stagnant, they're evolving and changing. So we have to understand we have expertise and yet we are not experts on this family or even experts oh. in this, yeah, 
or even experts in this relationship because this relationship is dynamic and ever-changing. Just like the parent-child yeah. relationship is dynamic and ever-changing. Just like your marriage. If you're married, it's dynamic and ever-changing. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we have to be able to stand on what we know and believe and be prepared to receive information that may shake our, our foundation a little bit. And then curiosity. The, the, the two things that always land with me about reflective work are curiosity and wonderment. Let's let's always wow. lean in with curiosity. That's curious. I want to know more about that. Because right. in my family, we don't sit on the floor to eat. So let's talk about that. Right. Yeah. 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 And Christopher said it before, pairing that I, I really have come to believe the this the idea of pairing that curiosity and wondering with humility. Um, because we may be curious, but we we may also constantly be seeing how it matches with what we know. And if we don't let go of that expert role and come to it completely humble and recognizing we don't know, um, that we won't we won't grow from right. it. We won't learn anything new. I think, and I just, holding babies, yeah, I think about this idea of that expert role or what we think we know. And how many times have we done the argument of breast versus bottle and which is better? And now one, <laughs> one generation is better, the other generation is better. And, you know, we know what's best is what's best for the diet. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 And there is no one size fits all. There we go. Exactly. And boy, if we could just get shout out to everybody watching, if we just get that to the world, <laughs> what's best for these two people, for this relationship is, and everyone's safe uh -huh. yes. is what we're going to sanction. That's it. Yeah. Let's let people choose what works for their family situation. No harm is being done. It may look different than your family situation. And there's love and tenderness and compassion and joy and respect for culture. And doesn't that just sound lovely? Yes. It does. Okay, everybody watching, you go out and do that for us, please. Uh -huh. yeah, let's do it. <laughs> we'll, we'll help, right? We'll help in our own way. Yeah. So yeah. And I, my last question, then I'm going to ask you for any final thoughts you want to share with the audience. What's, what's your hope for, for providers? Before I go there, I'm sorry, because I said I was going to say this, and I think it's so powerful. The thing that I love, you probably can't see this very, oh, you can. The thing that I love about the book is it's it's quite practical and i i love the examples you have and then you have they have supervisors responding to supervision situations and it isn't so much of do this it's more an example of the activity that they want you to understand and i think so much of our reflective practice narratives are conceptual which we need that too yeah and, and this in my experience is the first real practical guide so thank you Right. I can give Thank this to you. a novice and we can go through it together and even say, well, let's let's even go back to this skill and think about it with this family, because it is the kind of thing that I mean, I'm I'm going to continue to grow as a reflective practice professional. All of my it's this kind of it's, it's this like you think about a muscle, you just keep tuning it, you keep fine tuning it. So what is your hope for the provider community in, in providing this resource for, for all of us? Well, just as you asked this question, I went to a place that I hadn't thought about and haven't talked about in the past. And that is, and it kind of ties in with, again, our cultural and societal milieu that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's this idea of uh, withholding judgment. Uh, we know that psychologically we we are predisposed to judge because that's how we survive. We have to make quick decisions about, is this a, a friend or a foe? Mm -hmm. Is this gonna be harmful or is this gonna benefit me? But that whole notion of humility and compassion and reflection asks us to hold back from judging mm -hmm. and to, as you said, discover more, wonder, ask another question. Uh, peel back the layers of the onion so you're constantly revealing more so your understanding improves and so I think that's the in the big picture I think that that's what reflective work does and asks of us uh, among other things 
and what I hope the Rios, both the research, the, the research tool and the, the guide help people, help all of us be better at is not rushing to judgment, but really stepping back, finding that sense of empathy in us and mm -hmm. compassion and humility so that we can be self-aware and act in a way that isn't isn't reactive. Mm. I love just a minute, Jeff, because I do want to just underscore this because I heard in your story too, Christopher, that sense of compassion and also the looking in. Yes. Yes. So being being compassionate with the other and compassionate with ourselves. Exactly. As we learn to be patient as we approach new ideas and individuals that are different from us and be aware that we have a little bit of a reactivity as a neurological need and give ourselves some compassion, which I think is so very important as well. Deb, how about you? Um, so I, I guess I, I move just because of my role. Um, I move to more of the, you know, practical side of this. Um, and my hope with the Rios is, and we see this happening already. We, we've been talking about it from um, the, you know, this framework, um, moving it, expanding it almost from like a two-dimensional chessboard into a three-dimensional chessboard. That's how I think about it. Mm. As the further away from direct practice one becomes, um, in using the Rios as a way of thinking about the work, it becomes harder sometimes, I think, for um, those of us who aren't working directly with families and kiddos um, to think about, well, how do I keep that baby in mind? How do I mm. keep those families um, in mind when I have to be thinking about a budget or I have to be thinking about staffing and things like that? And so... What I, I hope to see is that there's parallel movement with respect to the, the, the research and the theoretical work going on and seeing how it impacts um, or how we can support the decision makers and the gatekeepers, essentially, whoever that is uh, within programs or even within systems. And then as Christopher said, how do we help support the acquisition of some of those more concrete skills, or as you said, those reflective muscles, mm -hmm. those skills and attributes that we associate with reflective mm -hmm. practice? Um, because until we do that, you know, all the theory in the world, it's, it's great in the field of academia, but it's not going to seriously impact where we want it to, and that's in bettering individuals' lives mm -hmm. um, and future generations, mm -hmm. because there's still a lot of hurting families and babies out there. Mm -hmm. And and that's what, you know, I think about is yeah. how are we holding those those little ones who will someday become parents? Um, there we go. Um, and and decision makers and decision makers yeah and, and all of that so that's what I hope to see down the road mm -hmm. um, and to look for ways to maybe more intentionally systematize it great I love that Christopher kind of zoomed in and you kind of zoomed out you use some reflection <laughs> language right where we're thinking about the diet and thinking about our own growth and um, Deb I liked how you mentioned systems as well. And we're we we have been talking about the the that magical space in the diet and the relationship and and yeah everybody go influence systems in any way that you can we know yeah. we know our workforce is, workforce is healthy and more productive when they're well nurtured so mm -hmm. reflective supervision it's not an add on it's not a when we have it in the budget it's not an you write it in <laughs> you make it a requirement of your work for unlicensed and licensed for trainees for everybody. Um, yeah. And even embedding it in pre-service, whether you are an early educator, if you're a social worker, whether you're in public health, how are we building in 
the acquisition of reflective skills and a reflective approach um, to pr perspective taking, to working with others, the safe holding, the compassion, the humility, all of those things um, while helping people to become an expert in whatever it is they choose to do. To me, that's part of becoming an expert is, is holding those, those attributes as well. Well, I, I have to say, as we need to wrap up and you also can, I'll, I'll give you both a final word or a final comment, but I'm so grateful to the SEEDS program for putting, for supporting this work to zero to three for supporting this work as well. And the University of Minnesota for supporting this work. So shout out for those folks who are helping on the ground, creating the, you know, the financial support um, and allowing you the privilege of leading this work. And I want to just, I'm, and I'm so honored to have had a small part in it and to get to know both of you even better, which bring into my community of professional friends. Yay. Love to have uh -huh. you on my video series. Christopher, last words for the audience. Uh, I think the, the the one term that we haven't touched on today, there are several probably that are, uh, are also um, to be talked about or discussed at another time, but this notion of critical uh, self-reflection mm -hmm. and that in the last, I would say in the last month or so, uh, has been such a strong part of my thinking mm. as I become aware with regard to myself of how much I have absorbed from my cultural and uh, uh, place in the world mm -hmm. people that i that nurtured me as i grew up the the educational systems that i was a part of the friendships that i've had how much those those influences are so much a part of me and mm -hmm. getting back to that notion of uh reserving judgment how strongly i have to fight against those things sometimes because they're so there's so much part of me and to make a decision to say that may have been what I knew and what I was told and what I learned at one time but it's no longer it's not helpful for me it doesn't serve my work or my personal life that's a big step for people it is. and and so Again, my hope for the, the Rios in particular is that it's one framework or one way structure for people to take a lot of what they have learned from the many people who have written and voiced incredible, incredibly wise things and supported the research and the discovery of who we are as hum humans. It's a structure, hopefully, that helps people bring those things together, connect them so that they're more useful in the sense of having kind of a path or a, a, a framework to remind mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. of these big ideas that so many people have contributed to. Thank you. Deb. That final thoughts? What he said. What he said. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I really, it's interesting. I Maybe we're on the same journey. Um, yeah. But I think this whole notion of, yep, just being reminded regularly to check in with ourselves. Um, if, if this does nothing more than to check in with ourselves um, and compare what we think we know what our framing, our cultural framing is and everything that implies with just taking the time mindfully. Yes. About what the other is experiencing mm -hmm. and mindfully considering that, that in and of itself will go a very mm -hmm. long way, I believe, to not curing all ills, but certainly to better and more authentic understanding and more authentic compassion. 
Um, and, and, and that's really, you know, it, it's touched on in so many different frameworks. We think about trauma-informed practice. We think about DEI. Um, they are all incredibly important. They are something whose time is way overdue and coming, but that's where it starts. And so if, if the Rios can do that and just be a, a concrete reminder of perspective taking, especially with the, even ourselves and how we think about things, then great. Love it. So it's holding the other in mind. It really is very simple. Yes. It really yes. is very simple and yet so hard to do. So no hard go ahead and get your copy. I'm receiving no financial benefit from this at all. <laughs> 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 but go and get your copy. Very practical. Not, you know, it's not, I know it's not a long read. It's not 400 pages. You can do this. Do reading group. You and your, read one chapter a month and then talk about it. I mean, it's just so very accessible. I, I really am not saying enough wonderful things. Mwah, mwah, mwah. You're both fabulous. Thank, Thank you so much you. for being my guest today. Thank it you. It was our one. pleasure. Yeah. Remember to help me change the world one relationship at a time. Remember to follow me on all my challenge channels. I always say challenges. Remember <laughs> to follow me on all my channels, which is a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and, and share this video with all your friends.